Well, let's consider the physiology now of this part of the brain relative to the inputs derived from the two eyes. And, and now we'll move to an animal model system where microelectrodes can be inserted into the brain and the two eyes can be stimulated separately. And one can assess to what degree are action potentials driven by one eye's inputs or the other. So what we're looking at here is a histogram that represents the compilation of physiological responses recorded from the kitten visual cortex. So the kitten was a very common model system for studying the development of vision uh, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, now we use a variety of other models, in including other carnivores such as ferrets, and uh, even rodents such as uh, mice and rats are now common model systems for doing this kind of work. And what can be shown at the level of an individual cortical neuron is that that neuron, regardless of what layer it may reside in the visual cortex, is very likely to have a bias in the response of that neuron that will tell you something about the weighting of inputs that are driven by the two eyes. For example, if a neuron in the visual cortex is driven exclusively by the contralateral eye, then the ex experimenter will assign it an ocular dominance group of one. If the neuron is driven exclusively by the ipsilateral eye, then the um, ocular dominance group assignment would be group seven. So this is purely an operational definition and uh, somewhat subjective, although it can be quantified in, in different ways by different investigators. Well, somewhere in the middle then would be units that are binocular, that is, they respond to inputs being presented to uh, each eye separately, but they tend to have some bias. So uh, here in the center of this distribution, uh, ocular dominance group four would be uh, a totally well-balanced uh, set of inputs being driven by the two eyes converging upon the same neuron. So while that uh, does typically uh, yield the greatest uh, number of cells among these seven um, different ocular dominance groups. Um, obviously, there are more neurons that are either biased towards one eye or the other than are perfectly binocular. And so this is uh, fairly typical of your uh, normally developing visual cortex. And so it's not perfectly a normal distribution, but it is uh, centered on binocularity with representation on either side. Now in kittens, there does tend to be a bit of a leftward shift in this distribution with uh, probably a greater percentage of contralaterally biased neurons and ipsilateral biased neurons. So this is what a normal distribution would look like in a typically developing kitten. Now, the experiment that was initially done by David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel and their colleagues involved keeping one eyelid of a kitten closed during this time of typical brain development in early postnatal life. And what they found as a result of this early manipulation of visual experience is a dramatic shift in ocular dominance bias in the visual cortex. So when they repeated this experiment uh, after surgically uh, keeping shut the eyelid of a developing kitten, what they found was that virtually all of the cells that showed visual responses now became responsive to the eye that remained open. Now obviously to do the experiment they had to uh, open the eyelid that had been sutured shut so they can test whether that closed eye uh, could now drive visual responses, and the answer is that it could not. Now, what was fascinating about this story is that when they recorded from the thalamus of these kittens, they found that the thalamus was responsive to the previously closed eye, but not the visual cortex. So this indicated that there was some change at the level of the cerebral cortex that was primarily responsible for what appeared to be an acquired blindness of that closed eye. And we call this phenomenon of cortical blindness to the inputs presented to one eye, amblyopia.
Now, yet another remarkable aspect of this uh, discovery was that they attempted to repeat the very same experiment in adult animals. And what they found in adult animals was hardly any change in the relative distribution of ocular bias and binocularity. And when they repeated the very same experiment initiated not at birth but at one year of age, what they found was essentially a, a normal distribution centered on binocularity. So, so this led to several really important um, insights. One is that uh, it is possible to change the structure of the circuits that are laid down there in cortical layer four as the thalamus innervates the cortex based on the balance of activity that are derived from the two eyes. And that the sensitivity of this circuit to this kind of manipulation of experience is restricted to an early period of postnatal life. And this allowed for the definition of what we now commonly call a critical period. So there is a critical period in early life where these circuits are sensitive to changes in activity dependent modulation of ongoing neural activity by sensory experience. Now subsequent investigators went on to ask what actually is different about the circuitry. What was discovered is what appears to be a regression of the terminal arborizations of the afferents from the lateral geniculate nucleus to the ocular dominance columns that are representing the deprived eye. And commensurately, there is an exuberant growth of the terminal arborizations of those geniculocortical projections that are being driven by the open eye. So rather than having a balance of uh, ocular dominance columns, the greater expansion of the cortical territory of the afferents that are driven by the open eye uh, accounts for an increase in the size of the ocular dominance columns that serve the open eye at the expense of those columns that serve the closed eye, which tend to be reduced both quantitatively in terms of numbers of synaptic connections, but also in terms of the spatial extent of their terminal arbors. One might have imagined that following the pre-critical period, there is some kind of uh, complementary and relatively uh, spatially uh, equivalent distribution of afferents to the visual cortex that are representing the two eyes. And as the critical period begins to ensue and this circuit becomes especially sensitive to the impact of experience, uh, what one might discover is an expansion of afferents that serve the open eye and a regression of those afferents that serve the closed eye. And this is indeed the anatomical picture that was observed by uh, Hubel and Wiesel and Simon Levain and Carla Schatz and, and many others since their time uh, doing these kinds of experiments in kitten and in some instances, um, rhesus macaque visual cortex. Now you may be wondering about um, whether these effects can be reversed and uh, just about uh, all permutation of this sort of experiment that you might imagine has been done and I won't take the time to talk about uh, the entire canon of what is known about ocular dominance plasticity in early life, uh, but I will say that it is possible to uh, reverse this effect uh, if we are able to intervene within the critical period. Uh, if not, if the critical period uh, passes and intervention uh, does not begin during that critical period while that window is open, this can result in a lifelong visual deficit. Uh, this cortical blindness for the deprived eye may persist uh, across the lifespan. So this raises considerable urgency when treating uh, infants that may have an, a correctable ocular defect in one eye to prevent this kind of uh, amblyopia for, for setting in and leading to lifelong visual impairment. Well, for those of you that are interested in vision as I am, um, I hope you find this uh, a fascinating paradigm. 
to learn about. Uh, for those that aren't particularly interested in vision, I want you to know that ocular dominance plasticity has remained a gold standard in the field of developmental neurobiology for understanding the influence of experience on brain development in early life and uh, continues now some uh, five decades after the seminal discoveries on this topic were first made. Uh, this remains uh, the gold standard in the field of developmental neurobiology. But with any kind of gold standard, uh, one does uh, have questions. Uh, one might wonder whether this general lesson that we've learned about studying ocular dominance column development truly applies to all kinds of circuits in the developing brain? Or are there some somewhat idiosyncratic features of this story that might limit our ability to generalize? So um, what I'd like to do is to suggest that indeed perhaps uh, the latter is the case. That is, uh, we need to explore other kinds of properties of developing cortical networks if we want to understand more broadly the impact of experience in early life, and that what we've learned from studying ocular dominance columns, as powerful as it has been, um, may not inform us about the development of other kinds of circuits.